So all I was going to say in, in um, uh, not in opposition to Francis, but just to make investing a bit more fun, because uh, let's face it, passive investing doesn't sound like much fun. You say, give me money to that guy and I'll just do something for 30 years and it'll all come right. <laughs> so what about, Francis is right, passive investing is a better thing to do than to try to pick all your own winners, but you might have different pots of money for different levels of risk. And then you've got all these different places that you can put that money where it can then be passively invested. Because there are choices, active choices involved in passive investment as well. So if you're going to do that, and any sensible New Zealander would have some diversification offshore, um, I will talk a little bit about what's going on in the world, because if you know what's going on in the world, to some extent it helps you at least understand why your passively invested funds are either shrinking or growing, and what might happen next. So i start that process by talking a little bit about me. I've actually had other photographs taken since this one where I look less smug. But, <laughs> but I'm, someone helpfully <laughs> said to me on about the 3rd of January this year, oh, you're going to be 60 next year. Oh, shut up. Um, but I am. So I was thinking about my career the other day and thinking that it was sort of bookended. You know, when I started working for Roger Douglas, it was just complete madness. I was, I was a junior business reporter at the Dominion and I got offered a job as a press secretary at Parliament. And suddenly I was in the middle of this incredible maelstrom, uh, which was really kind of the, 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 the bow wave of globalisation, which was just starting off at that time. You know, Douglas came after Thatcher, came after the general... Um, disasters of, of Muldoon and um, sort of uh, statist Britain. Um, so through my whole career, from since I was about you know, 23, 24 until now, has been about this huge flowering of, of internationalism. You know, when I was working for Roger in my 20s, it was all about how all the poor countries were going to get a chance to trade with the rich countries and it was all going to be beautiful and fair and that was the kind of the underlying idea, because it didn't quite work out that way. But um, it was also the end of the Cold War, and so for some of the people in this room, you'll remember the Cold War and the threat of nuclear annihilation and so forth. That all went away in 1988-89 with the fall of the Berlin Wall, and it seemed like capitalism had won and all that sort of thing. Now, as our career comes to an end, well, not yeah, you know, probably got 10 years up my sleeve, but you know, it's, I'm starting to do things. You know, James at the back here is teaching with the tuba. I had my first lesson earlier this week. Uh, this is all part of my retirement planning. Um, uh, the big thing that's coming up up in the near future is climate change, which wasn't, you know, that wasn't there. It was sort of an issue that people started to talk about in the 90s. But now it's this thing we've got to actually deal with. And in terms of the investment community, the reason I've, I've uh, bookended myself with this guy, John Follett, who is a little bit older than I am, uh, who gave his 28th profit report as the head of Sky Television last week. His career has been bookended by the advent of cable television and paying for TV, which was all terribly exciting and new, and he had this fantastic monopoly based on satellite communications for most of that 28 years, which is most of his career. And he's coming to the end of that time with looking as if he's probably about as relevant as a um, video easy outlet <laughs> within the next three or four years as streaming and so forth takes over. So uh, all, all I'm saying is that, what am I saying? Uh, 10 years seems like a long time, 20 years seems like a long time, 30 years like, seems like a long time, except when you're living through it. Occasionally you have to look back and say, look, such a lot of stuff changes so quickly within a lifetime. But one of the things that, that uh, has changed a huge amount in my lifetime is who's got what in the world. Not as much as perhaps would make it a fair world, but certainly um, I found this, this uh, sort of soccer ball representation. So the pink bit, that's the Americas. There's Canada, there's the United States. 330 million odd people. Here's Nigeria, 200 million people. That's the size of their economy compared to the United States. Um, here's Asia, China 20 years ago, 25 years ago would have been probably like Russia is today. Japan with, with uh, you know, there's a billion people here, Japan with uh, 100 million and shrinking, 
still about a third, a little more than a third of the size of, of the Chinese economy. These people are really rich. These people are up and coming. Here's Europe. Um, <laughs> this is us in here somewhere, other countries. <laughs> That's Australia. Um, it's just interesting to think about how, how, how sort of weirdly unequal everything is in terms of where wealth is distributed and owned, particularly when you think about where wealth is being created from. So very broadly speaking, I, like Francis, I've liberally stolen these slides from the internet, but I, I'm sure they're all completely accurate, uh, or were within the last six months. Uh, so China is the engine of world growth, everybody knows that. The United States is still an enormously dynamic economy. I mean, it looks like such a mess from here as a society. But its, its capacity to create wealth is still huge. Um, India, which is actually quite a small economy because it won't um, integrate with the rest of the world, is still growing very fast. And then you get the EU, which is kind of about the same size as the USA, but it, it contributes nothing like the level of, of uh, growth that... Um, China and, and the United States together represent the, the engines of global growth and continue to do so. Of course, part of that is because uh, the United States has almost limitless capacity to create debt. Uh, and this is how the, the world debt picture looks uh, today. And a lot of that growth is what's happened since the 2008 global financial crisis, as it's wrongly called, it should have actually been called the Western financial system global crisis, which happened to hurt Japan, but not us in Australia, because our banks were reasonably sound and we weren't being stupid. Um, China's uh, debt has been growing strongly, but one thing to bear in mind about the Chinese is they owe all of that debt to themselves. So they can, they, they can actually kind of pay it back more easily than the Americans, even though the Americans have created a lot of that wealth as well, out of nothing. Uh, Japan, you can see the problem that Japan eventually will have is it's, as we saw before, it's a big economy uh, with 100 million people in it, but it's shrinking. In another 20 years, it'll have 90 million people in it. You go to Japan now and you go into the regional areas, as I did about a year ago, you find all these villages with virtually nobody living and there's houses just empty. And they, they could solve our housing crisis if all the Aucklanders who don't have a house could go and live in <laughs> regional Japan. Uh, and then you've got the, the Europeans, they've, they, you know, they've got a lot of debt as well. Countries like Russia, which I can't even see here. Oh, there it is. That's, debt's not really a problem for Russia. Alcoholism and, and cronyism, uh, more the issue there. Uh, and you've all seen this kind of picture before. This is only five years apart. Uh, 2013, Exxon and PetroChina, both fossil fuel companies in the top five most uh, publicly traded companies in, by market cap in the United States, all digital companies by 2018. And you know, these guys will just get smaller as time goes on. I think Apple will get smaller too, actually. I don't know if you, about you, but I'm sick of them. <laughs> you can't, it's so arrogant that you have to plug their stuff in, no matter what's going on. So, so the next thing is, Green energy. So this is a bit of a funny one to read, but imagine this is the this is the industrial revolution. This is this is big blackbird is the use of coal from the 1850s through to now. So coal shrinking and will have to shrink to nothing quite quickly. Um, there's renewables. That's that's what we get. You know, 75 percent of our electricity comes from renewables. 85 in a good year. We're really unusual in that regard. Um, natural gas has displaced coal and will continue to do so for quite some time yet, I think, even though it's, it's not a popular view in some quarters. Um, you can see how nuclear has never really taken off. And other renewables, while that's obviously a fast rate of growth for other renewables, that is a tiny proportion of total electricity production in the, in the world. So when people say solar is the answer, I think they're sort of right because the sun is a fantastic source of energy, but it's going to take a coal-style revolution for solar energy to, to, um, to take over and, and, and slave us, given the current levels of uh, actual solar. And also, maybe not this, but 
just just go to this. This is this is uh, materials consumption everywhere as forecast by the OECD last year through 2060. So, rich countries, the OECD already got all the stuff we need. So we're just sort of ch chunking through the uh, biomass, fossil fuels, and metals. What this, what these three top ones are, and the bottom ones is non-metallic minerals. So we're already rich. So that these are growth rates, not total consumption. BRICS, which are emerging economies, they're not rich yet. So they're using heaps more because they're getting rich. And the rest of the world, well, they're still trying to catch up. So their rates of growth um, accelerate quite strongly. And it, so I'll go backwards, if I can, to this chart. Which So these are the, these are the 20 most populous countries in the world. In 100 years' time, none of these will be in. But it'll be out. Uh, several of these Asian cities will be out, and some of the biggest uh, cities in the world will be weird places like Mogadishu, uh, Dar es Salaam, Nairobi, Cairo also will be very big, Johannesburg. So uh, population growth is ha all happening in Africa. And I, I find it incredible to think that a place like Mogadishu, which hasn't even had a government for about the last 30 years, could end up being one of the five or ten most populous cities in the world within the lifespan of, say, my grandchildren. The other thing that's happening, which is really important to understand, is that despite the, the you know, constant narrative of poverty and, and hardship and gassiness in the world, which is obviously plenty, uh, GDP per capita across global economies is starting to converge. So the rich countries are slowing down, the poorer countries are starting to catch up, and over time, growth rates in the global economy start to converge as a result. There's a population effect in there as well, so even though the global population is growing, it starts to come to a, a, a sort of a, a natural endpoint as um, uh, medicine and, and birth control and so forth become widely available in parts of the world where, where it's not. So towards the end of the century, the, the global economy, the global population starts to slow as well. The other thing to think about is, is that there's not, it's not just about fossil fuels in terms of uh, environmental impacts we've got to think about. The one that gets me here is uh, the impact of concrete. So, th so this is the, uh, yeah, again, it's the OECD Global Resources Outlook. They've chosen four areas as the key areas to think about for pollution impacts. One is concrete, one is copper, one is iron, and the other one's other metals, which is a bit of a cop-out. But um, look at the uh, impact. So the green is the impact on climate change. Concrete has a massive impact on climate change. Every time a building gets built with concrete, with which there are millions going up around the world, and that particularly in the developing world, these basic building blocks of our society, copper, so it's so ubiquitous in, in uh, electronics, uh, having substantial effects, which are somewhat compounded by the fact that there are so many people in the world who are becoming affluent enough to be able to buy the stuff that we've been taking for granted for the last 25 years. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, all kinds of things, obviously. Usually it's the things that you can't see coming. So um, the most recent ones, and that this, is, this is supposed to represent the global impact. So that suggesting that Germany annexing France in the Second World War is actually more significant from a global perspective than uh, the Brexit vote, the 9-11 attacks. You see the global financial crisis doesn't even make it here because it's, it's actually not a black swan. It's something that could perhaps have been foreseen. It was just a bunch of people believing that they were managing risk and, and actually making it worse. The one that I think is not here which should probably be there just like the Brexit vote is the election of Donald Trump in 2016, which was certainly a surprise to those of us who thought we knew what the hell was going on. Other things that go wrong, another global financial meltdown, I actually think it's a little bit over, overblown in the sense that uh, the global financial system has been packed up with capital to a much greater extent than was the case in 2008. And if you're watching the paper at the moment, there's this big battle going on between our trading banks and the Reserve Bank. The Reserve Bank thinks that the trading banks need even stronger balance sheets than they have now. The trading banks actually have pretty strong balance sheets by global standards. 
our, our central bank saying, not good enough. We want to be really safe and stable here. And you'll see a, a, a big um, debate about that over the next couple of months, I think. Uh, the other thing I think, and I think this is one of the biggest things, is globalization versus democracy. I don't know how you feel about it, but I'd also say my, my career has been bookended by optimism about democracy at one end and deep pessimism about whether democratic capitalism is actually up to the task of the next 30 or 40 years. The trouble is that the, the kinds of leaders that are emerging as a result of that breakdown uh, tend to be autocrats or, or um, sort of so-called big men uh, of the kind that you see in Trump uh, in um, oh, Kim Jong-un, Jong -un, Xi Jinping, who basically uh, declared himself a dictator last year. And that's one of the reasons why our relationship with, with China is so much more difficult now, is that China has changed as well as us. Um, so there's a huge battle to go to happen there, I think. And climate change, which just you can't ignore. You know, I, I buy into the, the idea that we have 12 years to act, or we did as of last December. And um, I'm a pessimist about whether we'll manage to do that or not. But from an investment perspective, there's a huge number of assets that are at risk and a huge number of new industries which will emerge. Um, you know, we're into adaptation now, and the process of adaptation is a massive commercial opportunity. Just don't buy beachfront land, I would say. Uh, I worry a little bit too about New Zealand and its place as a, as a, as a distant tourism uh, venue. I think flying at some stage or other, we're going to have to get a bit more hard-nosed about what that really does from a climate change perspective. I don't want to go on too long, but I'll just talk a little bit about what's, what the outlook is for, the, for global growth. So the greener, the deeper the green, the better the growth. So we're in pretty good shape, really. Australia and New Zealand, um, Asia, uh, China and India growing very, very strongly. Uh, pretty crap in the States. Brazil um, actually kind of going backwards in Argentina and Iraq. Um, Russia, ongoing basket case. Um, most developed parts of Europe, very low growth. So, you know, I'd say for the last 10 years or so, I've, I've finally thought, thank goodness I didn't do my OE and end up in Britain. I actually feel like I'm in the right part of the world uh, these days, whereas I always used to think, why didn't I get out? Can I just ask a question? What looks remarkably dark? Libya. What, what, what looks remarkably dark? Libya. Libya? Yeah, well, it's. <laughs> I would say that that's a, an indication of how, how blasted that economy has been and the uh, resumption of oil production. So it's actually, in its own terms, growing very quickly. It's just not to say that it's a great place to live. So I mean, it's, it's kind of the same with China. You're always going to get stronger compound growth rates in a country that has far more to go. That's what's kind of interesting about Australia and New Zealand is we're developed economies which are showing high rates of growth. And my personal view is that we'll continue to do so, and in fact, we'll start to uh, get a bit of um, migration the other way from Australia if the impact of climate change is as significant as we think. The Aussies will start running out of fresh water. There's a lot of space and a lot of water in New Zealand. I think we're going to become increasingly, and also be temperate. So further away from the equator, the better. I think New Zealand is a sort of a long-term hold, is how I'd describe it, um, from a uh, sort of geo physical perspective almost. Uh, I think I've talked about this, so the global economy at, at the moment, if, if the blue line is uh, advanced economies, the middle line is the world, and the top line is the emerging economies which tend to grow faster. They've been through this period, this, this goes from 1980, basically you've had lots of jumping around and very strong growth in the emerging economies, it's all starting to flatten out now. Um, Francis had a, a slide a little bit like this one, so I'll move on it quickly. The only thing I would say is that's, that's a hell of a long upward ride on the roller coaster. So that's, that's since 2011-ish, uh, so after the global financial crisis. Um, this is the volatility of last year. I mean, you'd, you'd hardly say, if you looked at that the first time, that that was something to worry about, particularly if you bought here. Or here. 
And that is basically what went wrong uh, with central banks around the world, which is they, they created money in the belief that it would reflate economies. And in fact, what everybody did was put their money into shares and real estate and pumped up asset values everywhere. So that's why that could be a bubble. Uh, so that's the volatility of the last half of last year, all over the place, but again, in the context of, of that, that's, that's that bit. Does it, you know, how much does that really matter? Only matters if you only ever entered the market for the first time then. So a couple of, just a couple of tips on the New Zealand economy. If you're, if you're watching the news about, about our economy, um, there's been a lot of stuff in the media since the election of this new government about confidence and its impact on growth. Confidence and growth are poorly correlated over time. The much better thing to look at for a guide to what might happen in the economy is how, how businesses are feeling about their own circumstances because they can have all kinds of views about what might be happening out there but the, the one thing they do know is what their own books look like. Very often you can talk yourself into a funk and still be having a good year. So look at investment intentions when you see the, the uh, reports of the say uh, NZIER quarterly survey of business opinion rather than the pure confidence numbers. Uh, in New Zealand, the employment intentions are still firm. The weird thing about the New Zealand economy is that it's been putting on jobs like nothing on earth, but uh, almost nothing in the wage, way of um, significant wage increases. They've been keeping up with inflation, a little bit more than inflation, but which is good by global standards, and our employment rates are extraordinary by, by global standards. We've got pockets of, of terrible unemployment, but it's, they're pockets rather than a, a, a national problem. The main, main problem in New Zealand is finding people to do things. And, and that's what that graph shows, that all levels of skill, including unskilled workers, are becoming increasingly difficult to find. So the, the squeeze on labour costs must be coming. Um, just a little bit of an NZIE. I looked at the first time late last year at what drives business confidence, since we're talking about that. Government policy and labour costs. So labour costs, I think, is rational. Government policy, I think, is um, more a matter of getting used to what's coming. I, I personally think after 30 years of observing the New Zealand economy that governments has, have much less impact than they think, They're notwithstanding Rogeronomics. Um, most of the time people just get on and it's the things that are happening in the wider world that, that are the real determinant of their success or failure. Uh, we've got a reasonably robust uh, growth outlook. Uh, the New Zealand dollar continues to, to look a little weak, so that's good for exporters, not so good for imported things like fuel. Um, and when you talk about a weaker exchange rate, it's a little bit like that graph of the uh, global financial crisis. It's quite a strong exchange rate when you consider where, where it's been since 2001. So it's nearly 20 years of the New Zealand exchange rate. It's just a long, straight, slightly upward line, which, which is basically a story which says you should be confident about New Zealand's prospects. So the other thing that happens when you get labour shortages and growth and lower New Zealand dollar and capacity constraints, you start getting inflation. So most people in this room probably forgotten what inflation is, I certainly have. Uh, I, d I find it hard to believe that when I and my wife took out a mortgage in 1983 or four, we were paying something like 17% interest. Can you imagine that? Like almost $1.05 is going back to the bank for the total value of your lending every year. So borrow 100000 you had to come up with $17,500 every year to service the mortgage and then you get onto the capital repayment. So it's just incredible compared to today. Um, but inflationary pressures will start to re-emerge and you might see interest rates ooh, as high as 6% perhaps on on home mortgages in the next two or three years. Longer term, just a little, you know, my little thing about New Zealand, I think, I think we're in a great spot. Temperate, got lots of water, even if it's some of it's or too much of it's a bit dirty. Got low population density, uh, a very large country, you know, the size of Britain, the size of Japan, with very few people in it, and relatively youthful uh, and politically stable. I mean, I think our, our democracy is in better shape than a hell of a lot of others. The problem is we don't really matter to anybody else, so it becomes partly our job to, to protect what we've got uh, by whatever wily means we can come up with. Because um, I think we will see um, 
a lot more migration pressure. People will want to leave the parts of the world which are becoming too difficult to live in, and ours will look attractive. Uh, at the moment, our entire defence effort is based on being a long way from anywhere, and that will continue to work to some extent. But uh, I think, you know, you, you, I wouldn't surprise me if in 10 or 15 years we were having a completely different discussion about what New Zealand's defence capability should be uh, because of these pressures coming out of the uh, tropical parts of the world, where, which will be coming quite unpleasant places to live. Um, and it, you know, it's a truism to say that the pressures of tourism and, and intensive agriculture are going to, going to I think, uh, require some very large changes in land use and, and uh, industry investment here. Anyway, happy to take any questions. Sorry to ramble on. Yeah, it's a bit of a problem, isn't it? And it's, it's, that's, the, that's part of the New Zealand story. There's no way around it. I, mean, I didn't realise that until I kind of started Business Desk by mistake 11 years ago. And within about two or three years, we either had every possible customer or had already had them and been fired or, you know, they'd gone out of business or something. You think, crikey, it's, it's really hard to make a buck in this country compared to a lot of much bigger places. Um, all I'm really saying is, uh, I'm not saying put all your eggs in the New Zealand basket, I'm just, I'm just saying in the context of the various places you could be in the world making these kinds of choices, it seems to me that on a, any kind of rational analysis, New Zealand's not a bad spot. And having just been in Tasmania, the other good thing about being in New Zealand and being a man is that you could look quite sophisticated by comparison. <laughs> I don't know quite how that is relevant, but anyway. Any other questions? Uh, I, th I think a fair tax system would tax capital gains, but the, the government uh, will be under too much pressure from New Zealand First particularly over taxing businesses and farms, and that um, the only area that will be seriously attacked will be residential property. And it would be kind of perverse to, to attack residential property in the hope that people will make productive investment elsewhere as a result and then go and put a capital gains tax on those new forms of productive investment, particularly when it then becomes rational to put your funds offshore. And I think the government will, will go through that process, hand New Zealand first a win that they don't care about, be seen to have acted against rapacious landlords to do yet another thing of the many things that they're trying to do to, to take the heat out of the housing market, which is basically working at some level. Um, and then I think there'll be incremental attempts over the course of our collective lifetimes to expand the, the range of things that, that, that capital gains can be taxed on. Because it should happen. I mean, it's just nuts that... that uh, We've, we've, spent, we've basically created our tax system based only on what people's income is, which has been a fantastic rort for anybody with any capital wealth. Well, that's not fair. And it's not that hard to change. That's one of the nice things about living in a, in a functioning democracy is that you'll get some slightly impure compromise which nonetheless makes people feel better about things, maybe changes investment signals, and we all get on. Well, they are pretty expensive. Uh, that's more of an observation, really, isn't it? Uh, I, I, all I would say is that um, notwithstanding the many great opportunities that Sharesies and KiwiSaver and every other kind of investment offers, there's no better thing that you can do when you have a large mortgage than pay that damn thing down as fast as possible. So, because every dollar that you pay off the interest, uh, the capital on, is a sort of a tax-free element to that. And, um, you know, basically, my advice, for what it's worth, having as somebody who paid off their mortgage about 18 months ago, is always have it on a weekly schedule. So make a payment every week, because it makes a huge difference to how much interest you'll end up paying. Even though it doesn't seem like it, over 25 years, it makes a big difference, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and pay as much as you possibly can. You know, pay till it hurts to... to um, Keep your payments up high, get rid of that debt as fast as you can, would be my feeling. Notwithstanding low interest rates, I think the levels of debt that people have to take on these days are, are frightening. And I would, want to, I would want to try and kill that as fast as I possibly could. That's, 
I can't speculate on where those prices will go. Do I have to do a disclaimer that says this, is, this does not constitute investment advice? <laughs> but, but no, but look, the, the only thing that I think is a bit of a tricky choice is because if you, if you want a house and you need a house, then you're going to buy a house. So you might as well use what you, some of your savings to do that. Um, you might just want to think, if you think you want to buy a house in five years' time and you're going to rely to some extent on what your KiwiSaver um, brings in, and you're 35 years off retirement, and you might say to yourself, well, I need some of that money in five years, so I really want to go in a balanced fund rather than an aggressive fund because your time horizon is a bit shorter. Uh, and so you, you're not quite as willing as you might otherwise be to see your capital eroded in one year because it's, the market goes bad on you. You want to be a bit more sure that you're going to have actually something like the sum that you've set aside and hopefully a bit more rather than taking a big punt on the long term, which is what Francis was talking about. What you should do, if, if that's your simple horizon, I'm 20, I'm going to be 65 one day, I should just put it in and leave it and let it compound uh, in the most aggressive possible fund. You wouldn't necessarily do that if you need your money soon, I, I would suggest. Uh, well, I guess the, the one thing you can say about the US is, is it's exposed to the whole global economy uh, and it's an extremely liquid market. So, um, uh, yeah, it's, as, it's as safe as any other market to be in. I, I, I think, from, I mean, I, I hate what's happening in America, but I do think that the United States will remain a surprisingly robust and, and dynamic economy, so I wouldn't have too many problems as long as you're thinking kind of medium to long term. I think more the issue, well, it's also, okay, I, you, you probably would be right, it's probably, aviation is probably a bit like New Zealand. Uh, it has very high rates of actual emissions, but it's such a small part of total emissions that it, you could argue it doesn't matter. But I don't see how you can uh, continue to have the growth of um, very low cost global movement, which doesn't acknowledge the fact that you know, if you get in a, a A320 and go to Auckland, you've got a, an, two engines which are capable of powering the whole city of Hamilton to take 300 people 700 kilometres. It's, it's incredibly self-indulgent flying. Uh, and I can't believe that you can do, it, do that for 39 bucks. I just, don't, I just can't see how you sustain that. I think you know, global aviation emissions will have to be part of, the, of what gets attacked. Um, I do think, though, that politicians and wealthy people will do everything they can to make it the last Thing that gets attacked, because we do need to be able to get around and see each other. And uh, I don't really buy that argument because so much of what we invest in now is services. I think we, we do run up when we're running up against environmental limits now, we're all, but we're also in the process of discovering ways to get around them. Uh, so, I mean, I, I guess I remain a techno-optimist, which is maybe not all that fashionable. But I, I do think that uh, we're getting better as a species at using less to do more. Uh, not to say that we won't uh, run up against barriers that we don't understand. I think climate change, some of those impacts could be those kinds of barriers. Um, but I think that the natural human tendency is to continue to create. Uh, and that um, you know, I've been optimist on the basis of the, of the passage of human history so far and the very low relative use of um, ox-drawn plows in New Zealand compared to the 1840s. <laughs> <laughs>